Hi, I'm Lawrence Goodman, a writer of Grey Cells, and you're watching Two Geeks Talking. Hi, I'm Kay, I'm the artist of Grey Cells, and you're watching Two Geeks Talking. It's actually Thank Three Geeks Talking. Isn't it Three Geeks Talking? We ruined your show, man. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's two geeks and a guy that, that asks you questions. I'm always <laughs> plus one. Well, they, oh, it's, it's the same as with my wife. I'm always plus one. Basically, Kurt, yeah. Kurt, we're giving you gold here. <laughs> yes, but I still have to edit all this together to make it cohesive. Yes, we appreciate it. <laughs> Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by two very talented creators on a worldwide project to bring you some amazing horror stories. Well, this is the first time I've, I've ever seen this particular comic, and I can't wait to see the fact that it's 130 pages of horror, which is a genre that is, I think, totally underutilized. We're joined today by the ever-talented Lawrence Goodman and artist Kay from Grey Cells. How are you guys doing today? Very good. Thank, thanks so much for having us on. Thank you. So for those that don't know anything about Grey Cells, tell us what it's all about. So Grey Cells is true detective if the Yellow King was really a supernatural menace. It's the story of a young boy who's uh, abducted by this man who, who no one wants to believe exists. So none of the teachers, the, the school, the authorities, social services, the police, none of them want to want to take it seriously. And it falls into uh, a newspaper journalist, Lena Santos, who uh, begins to look into it and she digs deeper and, and starts to find out the, the truth about what's happened to not just Josh, but um, another number of other kids that have, that have been taken by, by this character. So one, of, one of the first things that, that really struck me, not only with the writing, but it was the artwork as well, too. So we're joined today by, of course, your comic artist, Kay, as well, too. How did you guys meet up? Uh, I started trying to, to do it my, myself, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm nowhere near as talented as an artist as, as Kay is. So um, I got about seven pages in and, and was realizing it wasn't up to scratch. So I went on to uh, Reddit. And I was looking through um, some artist portfolios on there and I was looking for someone who could really draw kids well, um, could draw well in black and white and uh, who could do like realistic cities, uh, realistic cars, that sort of stuff. And I saw A's, um, K's work on, uh, on some, of his, some of his previous uh, comics and I fell in love immediately. Like it was exactly what I was looking for. Uh, I pitched him... The, the script um i had plotted out sort of the different characters and and where i thought their character arcs would go uh what what i saw would happen across it i messaged him and and thankfully he he was interested and he got excited and he messaged me back and uh we've been working on it since Ten. lawrence is selling himself short he's a he's a great artist but he's even better a writer he's like grant morrison you know grant morrison does these layouts for his artists it's, it's the British invasion all over again. Yes, I was looking for a new project. Lawrence pitched the story to me and thought to myself, oh, this is right up my alley. And I read the script. It's about this kidnapper, right, who abducts children. And I'm a father. I have a son. And uh, that night I had a nightmare. And it was my first nightmare in like decades. So I thought if a comic book script can make me, a grown man, have nightmares, it must be good. I was going to ask, you know, what, what exactly drew you to his script? Like, what was the, the first thing that popped out in your mind as an artist, like visually? It's that we, I think we grew up reading the same things and we appreciate the same things in comics. So I'm, I'm originally from Serbia. My childhood, I was exposed to a variety of comic books from all over the world, inclu including British comics from then there to 2000 AD. They were also printed mostly in black and white in my country. So I really appreciate, learned to appreciate the line work. Yeah, Lawrence's, Lawrence's pitch sounded just like that, like my kind of thing. What is misunderstood about the horror genre when it comes to comic? So good question. I, don't, um, I think you've got different sort there's, there's different um, subgenres of, of horror. So you've got stuff that's uh I, th I think the easy thing with comics is to lean into the sort of body horror stuff or the 
the overly um, visceral part of it. And then with, with this, we, we tried to take a more psychological approach. So there's a lot of blood in the gutters. There's a lot of stuff that happens off page and we let you <laughs> fill in the, the drama with your um, imagination. Yes, I think horror lends itself to, to visual storytelling a lot, like monsters, right? They're, they're like made from, for, so here's like a piece of artwork because I work traditionally, so you can see like a page. Beautiful. And we're not spoiling anything. This is like basically on the, on the cover. So that's the monster, but he looks like a frogman, right? And I'm sure Lawrence will explain because that's how children see him. The next time you see him, he changes his, experience, his uh, appearance and that's one of the things, you know, that's, that suits comics very well. And then, like Lauren said, this is the cliffhanger on the right page. Mm -hmm. And you're expecting something horrible to happen to the child. But it's, it's not that kind of horror. So when you flip the page, we cut the scene. So a lot of it's subtle, and the horror is left to your imagination. On one side, you have visuals. And on the other side, you have storytelling techniques. And that unique language of comics is something that horror really benefits from. There's, there's a lot of stuff that you can do Sorry. in comics that um, you can't do in other mediums as well. So a lot of people sort of try and make things overly um, cinematic. And, and this, is, this is sort of written in a sense that it's, it's episodic. It's six parts, one complete story. Um, it could, could be something that, that lend itself to like a Netflix or an HBO show. Uh, but it's uh, it takes full advantage of um, some of the, the stuff that you can do in, in comics. So uh, where you've got interesting sort of panel layouts that, that uh, combine into one great piece of art across a, a single page rather than uh, just sort of panel, panel, shot, shot. You have a, a wide cast of characters. You're in a fictitious U.S. city based on, you know, basing these horrors from various backgrounds and various economic uh, settings but what did you draw from to create these characters Lawrence? That's a good question um, I, I sat down and I tried to think of something, I, I started with something that I wanted to, that would scare me there was a lot of uh, stuff over the last couple of years where you've got these sort of multiple narratives that are being told and there's competing realities. I, even going back to, to childhood, the idea of losing control of your body, your mind, not being able to trust your senses has always has always frightened me, and so uh, when I tried to come up with a, a villain for for a story that, that turned into that turned into Grey Cells, that was the key thing that, that I wanted. So, the character of, of Frogman that we were showing, he has some psychic abilities, and he uses that to sort of manipulate people to control how they perceive things. And you end up in a situation where you can't you, you can't trust your own senses, you can't trust your own mind. And um, he uses that frog persona to sort of try and endear himself to, to children. Uh, so you can see in one where he looks a bit more Kermit the Frog style, uh, where he's like a, he's, he's trying and failing to uh, entice kids to, to trust him. But when he sort of switches and he gets angry, it becomes more monstrous people with, that he interacts with he uh, he can he can sort of manipulate how they perceive him uh, he can make them sort of believe things that, that he suggests and that was that was the where that villain came from where i grew up is uh, is very similar if not I'm, i grew up in the uk but i'm on the border of a place where you've got uh, lots of very deep poverty and then lots of rich people as well a lot of swimming in the middle so i wanted to create a world that spoke to that as well uh where you've got this this big divide where you, you've got people who are really quite poor and then people who are richer and and this whole mess in the middle that was a bad answer <laughs> no no not at all you know your work better than anyone else so the fact that i'm asking these questions i want to be able to help you convey that to those that are watching this interview. I want to make sure that, you know, they understand your, your thought process as a creative person. I want to make sure that, you know, you know, your passion for what you've created, because it is beautiful. I mean, 
your Thank your you. storytelling, your pacing, everything like that is is really amazing. And I love the fact that with a, an amazing art style with Kay as well, it just goes hand in hand. It it's very rare that I get to read anything similar to that, where it intrigues me to want to see more. The fact that I I I was I thought it was twenty three pages to be perfectly honest. And then I looked on the website and it's 130. I'm like, well, now you piqued my interest. Now this is <laughs> going to be something amazing. I don't want to leave people sort of uh, hungry for, for more. I, I wanted to tell a complete story because that was one of the things that always frustrated me with with some comics where they turn into like a soap opera and there's never an ending and you sort of get teased that it's going to go somewhere as a kid and it just carries on forever. I, I like things to have a beginning, a middle and an end. And that's what we've tried to create with, um, with gray cells. But the, the pacing is, is um, Kay, Kay has helped a lot with that. So I, I sort of had a, a bunch of stuff that I wanted to, to lay down in a, in a, one of the issues and, and he would go, okay, maybe we can move that to this one. And, oh, you, we could, we could squeeze this down and, and put these across these pages. And, and so work, working with, with Kay, so, uh, it's been a dream collaboration. It's your story. I'm just translating it into like a visual language. I get to cherry pick. Well, looking looking at the at the script, when you first got that script, Kay, and, and the fact that you read it and it triggered that nightmare for you, what was the first image that immediately popped into your head that you wanted to, to that you're like, this is how I want this story to, to start. This is how I want this character to be created. Like, like what exactly triggered your, your creativity for not only the villain, but for this first story? It's actually the challenge um, because the writer's job is to make problems and the artist's job is to solve them. And uh, Lawrence tasked me with, uh, with a challenge to show the invisible. Uh, the characters, most of them have these mental powers. So none of these are actual tattoos. They're actually manifestation, visual rendition, rendition of, of their mental powers. And I'm sure Lawrence will talk more about it. But how do you show those? How do you show the invisible, right? So that, that's something, you know, I, I had to work on and um, that's what attracted me. We wanted to steer clear of the the whole standard um, Professor X grabbing his temple and, and concentric lines spinning out of his forehead. We wanted to make uh, something that was a bit more visually interesting and then Kay knocked out of the park. Like uh, I, uh, That was basically my line is I don't want Professor X. And he came back with uh, these, these fantastic lines and uh, symbols that sort of appear to people. And then we were looking at um, uh, concepts around how we can make that visual and, and Kay drew on the Eye of Horus, something you spotted in, in Turkey, wasn't it? And you, you thought, oh, that, that's... I was on holiday in Turkey, and um, as you walk on the sidewalk, there's a, there's a bunch of cartoony eyes inside the sidewalk, like in the cement. And they're hanging from, from trees and hanging from houses. And I go, what is this? It's like an evil eye? And they explain that's the, actually the opposite. So that, that's one of the manifestations. That's how you visualize... You know, something that's that's invisible. So that's where the symbol came from. Although we have like both uh, bad guys and the good guys using mental powers. There's a cult, like this shadow world um, of people we don't know about, you know. And uh, th that's one of the, I think, main themes of, of gray cells, like the, the invisible. The art, it works in... in black and white but we've, we've also got a fantastic colorist in um Corey Ranson who uh overlaid some of that with an extra complexity when he when he came to the the psychic drawings and, and he started coloring in like um almost fluorescent colors that looks like uh like a a, a negative or, or if you put like a black light onto something I was amazed when I got the pages back because uh, the panels just popped popped out of the page it's it's uh I love the palette it's it's like completely completely new comic and he added um, a lot to the mix I, I i'd sort of wanted to do it in black and white to start like like Kay was saying earlier we, we'd sort of grown up with black and white as a um you, and you don't really miss what you you don't have so all the comics that i was reading i was reading like judge Dredd comics and, and things growing up and that was all black and white so i didn't really miss the color yeah Kay convinced me to do do uh 
like the first few pages of of um, part one and, and see how that goes. So uh, again, went back onto Reddit and found Corey who'd coloured up page from a Blade Runner thing, and and the, the colours I was like, oh, these these are great. Message message Corey and uh, what came back, I was I fell in love with again. Uh, sent it on to to Kay. He, he agreed that, that it was awesome, and we ended up just yeah yeah fine. We'll do the whole issue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is this is sold. It's, there's no way we can do it just in in black and white now. Yes, we were we were lucky with the letterer too, right? Um, Nikki Powers. Um, so she's a fantastic letterer, and also uh, again met on, met on Reddit, and she is uh, actually uh, a writer in her own regard as well. So she's uh, she does a sort of short stories, horror stories. As a result, um, because I'm I'm like a UK artist trying to, to write uh, American convincingly. Um, she's based in America, so that that helped a lot. She kept the dialogue honest. Sorry. It was, uh, I, I think, led to a bit more rounded characters and um, dialogue and that sort of stuff. Obviously, the pandemic has affected people in, in many different ways, uh, especially from a creative standpoint. How has it helped and hurt your creativity? And this is for both of you. It gave me a lot more time. So I was uh, working a full-time job. As a result, I was commuting to work sort of an hour each way, getting home, being exhausted, not really wanting to create anything. The weekend had rolled around and I'm still sort of recovering. Then obviously you've got the whole time when you're at work, you're uh, do, doing tasks for other people. The pandemic was brilliant in that regard because my commute became zero i could work from home i could have like five minutes to myself if i wanted to make a sandwich i didn't have to get off of the zoom call i was on so i became a lot more productive which meant i had time after work that i didn't have before i had time at the weekends i didn't have before couldn't have sat down and and dedicated so much time to this if it if that wasn't the case and also the the um inspiration of all the drama that that kicked up from it basically the world's divided into two camps and they both believed their own reality so strongly that was a big inspiration for creating a villain who could change the narrative to fit his own needs so that was that was quite cool and there has been horrible moments to it like uh, I, i'm sure i've gone insane because <laughs> Uh, just not speaking to another person for long periods of time is it's not good for not good for my um ability to speak as illustrated by that answer. Well, I mean, it helps you as a writer though. That's the main thing. So oh, yeah. a little insanity goes a long way. And just not having someone interrupt you, like uh, uh, just another voice in your 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 ear is so Kay, you were talking about you can listen to podcasts and um while, while you're working, I can't have anyone sort of even knock on the door if it just it would just interrupt. That's what my I'm saying. Process. Yes, yes, exactly. That's what I'm saying because it's thinking. You're thinking, so you cannot, you know, you, any other stimulus is disruptive. You know. So yeah. my point was like, what's thinking then? So I, if I don't have to think while inking, what what does it say about thinking? It means that you're used to the process and that it's a, it's a way for you to recharge yourself creatively. Yes, but it's also subconscious. If it's not conscious, if I can do all these lines and splat, splattering and all these scratches. For, for me, it's if I hear someone else's words, I can't hear my words. Hmm. And that's the, the bit that interrupts. So if I'm trying to trying to think of like a, a line of dialogue or something and I can hear someone talking in the next room. That's it. It's ruined. I can't focus mm-hmm. on anything but what they're saying. We're on to and something, guys. Yeah. We are on to something. This is the best part <laughs> of the podcast. I know we're like 30 <laughs> minutes in, but that means that the essential language of comics is different from the language of, of prose. Yeah. Yeah. So, so if, yeah, I'm not, so. if I'm not thinking in words, if you're thinking in words and I'm not, if I'm thinking in, in, in images, you know? It's a different part of your brain. Yeah. Yes, but we come together to create the same story. From a creative standpoint, how has it helped and hurt your creativity? I, I hate to say it, <laughs> not much has changed for me because like drawing, especially when, the, when you go into the inking phase, is very solitary, long work. 
So, you know, I don't even notice. Sometimes you draw a comic and then you, you know, lift, lift your head up from the paper and you look around and your friends have moved away and got married and you just, you know, just finished issue four. So, uh, yeah, I've, I've been drawing a lot, even more. I've been trying different things. Um, some of that you'll see in gray cells. I've been experimenting more, uh, letting loose. Um, I was just, the other day, I was thinking this page. Um, so oh, wow. you can see a lot of, a lot of like techniques with um, different kind of material. Um, so there's a lot of scratching with, with razors. There's a lot of sponge, a lot of splashing, splattering. Um, I'm, I'm back to using, uh, back to using the quill. Uh, so, you know, I have time and opportunity to do it. I use toothbrush for, you know, for effects, a lot of happy accidents, um, which I'm, you know, grateful to have opportunity to do. And also exploring, uh, exploring inking, um, which is my favorite part of the, of the work. It's very physical because I still work with traditional media. I have never made the transition to digital. I should, I know, I know I should. But still, I love it so much. So all that, you know, look at that. I just, my, my hands are a complete mess all the time. Like I'm always like, have, I can never wash off the ink. Um, um, I think I spent gallons. Um, I hope Glorence will refund some of that. Um, <laughs> the, all the well, ink. It, so um, I, I've noticed like stuff I've never noticed before with uh, inking this much. Like I, I like the, the listening um, to podcasts. Um, and um, I've noticed that I can I can ink and listen, like there are two separate processes. Whereas while I'm like doing the pencil, I have to think, I have to focus, and I completely block off the sound, so I have no idea what what you know what what's happening in the background. But when I'm inking, it's it's almost like subconscious. And um, I can even let go, you know. Um, so that's that was interesting. It fits really well with the theme of gray cells. Yeah. I would love to see some of the like the black and white originals that you you showed me are just incredible. I love that type of stuff. And that was when I went back to school at university for visual arts and film. I loved the inking process. I loved the. I'm a horrible artist. Don't get me wrong, but I loved working with the quill and working with it with the inks and all that other stuff. And I found, you know, freedom in the aspect of once you draw a line, it's there. Like I love the fact that it was just kind of a definitive. Oh, don't get me mark. started. Is that a good thing? That's a bad thing, man. Uh, to a certain extent, I mean. <laughs> Oh, I don't know about that. I mean, um, I, was, I was listening to other podcasts and the, the voice said something like, um, the real skill is created when the artist struggles with his tools. And I'm thinking to myself, fuck you. Oh, can we, <laughs> can we swear on this oh, yeah. podcast? Yeah, you can. Yes. You okay. Can. So I never made the transition to digital, but, you know, I really miss the undo option in real life. Why the hesitation to go to digital? Um, I love digital. I, I, I appreciate a lot of digital artists. Um, um, it's just that uh, it's two things. I've never seen anything done digital that cannot be done traditional. So I'm talking about, about old masters like Alberto Breccia, and I'm talking about new superstars like uh, Sean Gordon Murphy. So they're still working traditional. Um, I, I, don't, I don't see anything. And the second one is the happy accidents, the aforementioned happy accidents. Now, digitally, you can create brushes. You can create any effect that, and reproduce it in Photoshop, in whatever program you're working in. But then it keep, it, it's a pattern that keeps repeating, you know, and you never, you, you know, you never make a new one. You, you cannot make it by accident. Um, the good side is, of course, you never ruin the whole page, you know, just by <laughs> knocking over your ink bottle. Uh, it's a bit like the argument with, with music where you've got digital and, and analog. And my friend's a musician and, and he says that you can never accurately recreate an analog sound with a digital thing because it, it, it cuts off at a, cl a clean edge. Whereas um, analog 
with where he's talking about music with sine waves and stuff that it's it's a curve and it's a it's a constant uh a constant round edge and i think that's the same that you can see in the the line work and the the art you've uh, you can perfectly reproduce something digitally and it will, it will look fantastic, but just that edge will always be slightly different when it's, it's manual, when it's, uh, when it's a physical thing. And, and, uh, you know, like a, a, a little bit of ink dripping somewhere and then suddenly you've got some inspiration to, to go off or it forces you to, to do something slightly different. And you haven't got that undo button. I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm not. I, I actually like about uh, how digital looks on screen because it's made for screen. It's not actually made for paper. So once you, you know, once you do this, it still looks the same. Yeah. But if you do this with traditional media, all the lines look jagged um, because they're made for paper. And you have to keep the format in the size in mind and everything. And that's why we are planning on doing uh, the print edition. Looking at the fact that this is 130 pages um, and you're getting it printed, when is this campaign going to be started? Uh, November. We're just finishing up the last few pages now. Kay's K- um, K- inking, he, he reckons he's a, a, about a few weeks out. Um, there's a couple of things that I want to get ready for the Kickstarter itself. So I want to do like a, a promo video and, and things like that so that we can can hit the ground running with it. Yeah, you can you can get part one. It's, it's practically sort of live now in the sense that you can you can sign up uh, for early access um, at the the link underneath me, and uh, you can get part one completely free. And we will uh, message you so you're the first people to know when the the book goes live. Um, we'll we'll get you the best rewards and best discounts and, and things like that on it. There's a couple of rewards that we've been kicking around that, that we think we're going to go with. One of them is going to be uh, Kay's offered to draw someone into uh, the, the book as well. If they, if they want to be a part of it, he's going to, he's going to sneak you into um, a couple of panels. Um, we've been talking about doing sort of posters, um, signed special editions, uh, pin up art, that sort of thing. Uh, so we're just working out the, the finals of, of what they're going to be and what that's going to look like. Uh, we want it to be something that's going to be unique for Kickstarter as well. So a lot of the times when you back some campaigns, you'll end up with just the book that's going to be in the shop afterwards. So we, we, we don't want that. So we want this to be like a, a unique one-off. Um, it, it, I mean, it'll largely be the same. It's going to be the same story, but something that sets it apart. So we're looking at, maybe doing some sort of alternate covers and, and arts and things that, that you wouldn't be able to get outside of the campaign. From the creative perspective, and, and this may actually fine tune your, your, what your thought process is you're currently working on right now. What is your creative kryptonite? Not only for, as a writer, but as an artist. You know, I'll, I'll come up with a thing and then I, I, I have to challenge myself to not be obvious with the next step. When I was younger and I was trying to write, I would end up writing something that was really generic. And then I'd see it on TV like a, uh, a little while later. And I was, I was like, oh, for God's sake, I'm, I'm just following on to the next, next step. And then I, I started challenging myself that you've got to try and upend the, the expectations slightly and, and go a, a different route. And uh, we, w- we were joking around earlier before we came on about uh, this is horror, not comedy, but they've got a lot of overlap. It's it's both of them are going against what your expectation is. So the the story is the the world is okay. It's 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 progressing along at uh, a certain linear narrative, and then something unexpected takes you out of that and takes you onto a, an into another story. And in a comedy, that's that's funny. That's you know someone getting a pie in the face. Um, horror that's someone getting a knife in the face you know it's i will just um, quote big john busema who said goddamn cars and skyscrapers cars and skyscrapers perspective yeah yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah and lawrence made me draw a bunch of cars <laughs> here's one specific ones as well like i had I yeah had yeah yeah, yeah. He, he shares models yes i hate those like, <laughs> oh, it's the ford i don't know what oh sure lawrence it's a sure yeah and then uh 
here's a car and he just says oh car is going to the city well easy for you to say like that's you know yeah that's gonna <laughs> take me the whole afternoon you know but you know what seriously though i took the advantage of the setting so here's like a we mentioned detroit mm -hmm. and uh how it's uh it's set in a fictional city but uh, it's based on 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 detroit everybody focuses on the negative you know but there's so much beauty here Oh, yeah. it's uh, it's a very old, uh, gorgeous city, very European, you know, which I miss, um, and a lot of revival going on. Mm -hmm. So I picked a few locations, few authentic buildings, and we're going to showcase those uh, as our fictional settings in a uh, in gray cells. The architecture, like uh, I, I live across from Detroit, plain and simple. The the beauty of the architecture of the deco style of everything like that, that it's spanned from the forties to the fifties to the sixties that has still remained even after the turmoil that has gone through Detroit all, all those decades ago is it's just amazing and incredible. I mean, even the Penobscot building, this, the interior alone is, in, in, is in it's like, um, it's like layers of, of history. So you've, you can see uh, it's heyday in the buildings but you can also see where where it is now and and the the setting that inspired robocop is somewhere in the middle of that because it's uh different generations have, have lived in that city and it's been a different place for each one and that's something that we, we wanted to bring across into the the work i remember when i first spoke to to kay i was saying i want this to you know a city that that's been through this that's got a big divide where you've got skyscrapers where you've this big bankers and, and rich people live and then i want poverty and, and inner city decay and he was pitching me the same thing he was going i want i want to base it on uh, detroit because I it want, fits I've yes got... it, it yeah. fits so well it, there's this darkness you know that's hard to, to not to notice but there's this, also this sense of wonder and it really translates to comics at what point are we good enough used to be really anxious about doing the best every time and and having to things to be perfect and, and sometimes what would happen there is i wouldn't start things because i would overthink them and, and go go too far in it and he said just care enough to half ass it just um just care enough to do it badly get it done and then if you think you can make it better make it better but just care enough to do and then that helps you get started and you, you it, nothing's going to be perfect. Nothing's going to be exactly as you envisioned it. But if you care enough to do it badly, then you'll do it and it'll, and you'll, it'll be better than nothing. It goes back to the days when I realized how the sausage was made. I was a big fan of Prince Valiant and it features one of the greatest panels in the history of comics of the character fighting off a Viking army on a bridge. And then I realized it's, a, it's an homage or a swipe uh, from uh, Gustave Dior's, uh, uh, no, Gustave Dior's uh, illustration for a book. And in that book, they actually mock the scene. They're spoofing the scene. They're saying, like, that's impossible, you know? And I was like, fuck you. It's, it's not, it, it's, you, you don't really have to fight off vikings in real life but i distinctly remember how that scene in prince valiant made me feel like stand your ground be brave you know and we can all relate even if you don't fight vikings in real life you've been there you know you against the world and if an artist a writer a musician can make a little boy or anybody else their audience if they can make them feel that way if you have accomplished your goal you know, then it's, then it's good enough. When did your life change for the better? There's been loads of times. Um, there's when I left school and uh, started making money, my life got better because I didn't have the nonsense of teachers and injustice of school. I was a lot happier then. Um, when I met my wife, you know, that changed my life again and made me a better person. When... I actually sat down to write this and met Kay and, and actually have created something that I'm really proud of and is a great piece of work. That's changed my life and, and hopefully it's popular and other people like to read it and I can actually make a career of this. That would be 
that would be where I want to get to. And then, so that's why I'm still waiting. What is one mistake that you'll never, ever do again? I'll never submit my samples to Marvel and DC again. You know, I've been writing back and forth, but realized that um, I'm the first person who never wants to read K's X-Men. And um, I'm not sure anybody else does. And I'm, you know, decided to do my own comics decided to you know that the, the real joy is in in creating there's a lot of room and interest outside the big two so professionally this is like a like a turning point everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today who was that for you and this is for both of you i've always wanted to write from from the beginning of my life but there's been someone who, who made it click for me uh there's a guy who has a YouTube channel called Hello Future Me, and he he described something that that made something click for me in my head, and then ever since then, I've been able to write a lot better. Brandon Sanderson, he's got courses that he does for BYU. There was something in in one of those that that clicked for me and made me understand that I could see that how the sausage was made. Before it was just like I could tell it was when something wasn't right, but not why, and now. I've got a better understanding of it. So that those... What exactly was it that triggered you to be a better writer than from those two individuals? It's, uh, it's something called the try-fail cycle. Every moment your character's got a goal. I need to buy some eggs. So first I've got to get to the car. Uh, do I make it to the car? Uh, it's either going to be no uh, and something bad happens. So no, the car's been stolen and now I'm locked out of the house. Or it's, um, yes, I got to the car, but. So it's, it's a, yes, I got to the car, but there's no petrol. There's no gas. So now I need to figure out figure out that. And, and I was like, ah, oh, yeah, that because that, well, what I was doing before was, it was just a list of things that happen to a person. And um, it's not a story. And that was that was the thing that, that clicked with me. And then it was a similar Bit. So I, I, that was the first ingredient for it. And then um, the Hello Future Me YouTube channel, it uh, made it a little bit more clear. So he said something about uh, action and reaction. And I've wrote, I've, <laughs> I have to get, I've written it down in a notebook. And every time I'm like trying to write a thing, I'll, I'll open up the notebook and I'm like, yeah, are you doing this? Yeah, okay. It's not ingrained yet. That was the that was the thing that clicked. You know, we we usually don't remember our first comics, right? But you always remember that one that clicked. And um, I rem still remember I was like seven. I opened the splash page of Avengers issue sixteen, and you could see a a Viking god, a giant, a flying little woman, and a man in armor. You know, and um, I was like, you know, my mind was you know, blown away, like, what is this? And then um, my brother, my family, my friends and I, we all played it, you know, all they all wanted to be something. One guy wanted to be Thor, the other guy wanted to be Giant Man or the R, you know, even even my little sister could be the could be the wasp, right? I knew what I wanted to be, and that was Jack Kirby. Now, I could never be Jack Kirby, but um, there's like a range of other international artists that really informed my style. So if you, if you want some of Italian fumetti or some French BD taste, or you, you enjoyed Sin City or Swamp Thing, you should check out Dre Cells. From a professional standpoint, you're both creative in your own way. Lawrence, you're a first time writer, now creating a Kickstarter campaign for an amazing horror comic series of stories which is incredible with gray cells and Kay, you're a very talented artist that has been in the industry for many decades do you both consider yourselves personally successful I, I'm, so well, I'm, I'm, I'm very I'm, proud of this yes yes we're you know i'm doing what i what i like um what i always wanted to do and there's there's no greater joy than that yeah, this, this is this has been a fantastic. I, you know, I'm really proud of what the finished product looks like. I, I think it's uh, it's a it's better than than I thought I was capable of, and I, th I think it's a really good it's a really good book. So I'm I I think it's I th I'm successful in the sense that that I've created some art 
with the help of, of Kay and, and, and Corey and, and Nikki. And I'm really proud of it. And I, it's, it's something that I've written stuff in the past and, and been embarrassed to, to sort of show people or, or sort of uh, went, oh, it's not ready. It's not ready. This, I'm like, I'm like no, look at this. I'm, I'm putting it in people's hands. I'm like, yeah, just, no, you've got to download this. You've got, you've got to look at this. I'm, I'm going on, I'm going on podcasts and, and talking about it. Like I'm quite happy to have my face attached to it. I, I think it's a really good, a really good book. So, um, and, and the fact that we've, we've created it on our, on our own, like we, we haven't had, um, we we didn't have a Marvel or, or DC to um, to support us to putting it together, so we've we've created it and and edited it and. Also, we're guests on Two Geeks Talking, so that in, <laughs> it means we have arrived. We've, we've made it. <laughs> you, you've made it on the internet. There you go. <laughs> the reverse of the success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? I don't know. Art is not competition. Uh, the only failure is the one I see myself. Like if, if I don't like the line, you know, then I go back to it. And the same thing I say to my nine-year-old son, you know, if you fall, just stand up and go on. As for fame, fortune, you know, and, and scantily clad ladies, I don't, I don't measure success that way. As long as we can keep producing what we like, as long as... Uh, we can afford to be creative and content. And I think our Kickstarter campaign should enable us to share our work with, with many readers. And I don't know, there's, a, there's this good story about three artists, one who couldn't afford uh, to go to town and, and buy some meat because he was so poor, he didn't own a car. And the other guy who owned the car, the other artist went to town and he thought to himself, I wish I was, in, you know, a big a big famous artist who, you know, admired by critics and, and fans. And there was the third artist um, who was like, uh, had, was critically acclaimed and popular. And he was thinking, I wish I, wish I um, wrote that story that the first, uh, first artist did. Kind of um, chasing your own tail. You made up of all the little mistakes and the, the little errors that you've made along the way. And, and if you could change a thing, you wouldn't be you anymore. You'd, you'd be some other thing. So uh, even when I've done something embarrassing or cringy, it's, I can learn from it, grow and be smarter next time and make a new mistake. It's fine. <laughs> you just, you, you are the sum of all the bad things as well as all the good things. So it's not, it doesn't need to be a drama when you, when you fail, you just, you just keep going. Fail at something new. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a writer, as an artist, or creative maybe in a different sense with this vast world of technology that we have. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? <laughs> My son wants to be a YouTuber. And um, he asks if that's a real job or not. You know, I keep telling him, sure, why not? By the time you're old enough to to do it, you know, nobody will care about it. Just uh, like nobody reads comics anymore. So, well, all all jobs are imaginary. Like uh, unless you're sort of making food or you're laying bricks for a house, um, or you're making like every everything else is just art on top of that. No one really needs a banker or a lawyer or any uh, any job really. It, it's it's all it's all great. So there's no difference between being a a, a proper news anchor and a YouTuber, or uh, there's no difference between a professional footballer and an esports gamer. It's yes. It's, the only, uh, the only the difference is yes. The only difference is YouTubers are cool, right? Yeah, because my son just, definitely definitely wants Kurt's job. Well, I mean, if you if you really want my job, <laughs> it's not that difficult to do. You just got to put the time into it. But that's the that's the main thing that comes to being creative. You, whatever you do, you have to put your time into it. You, you know, as a writer, as an artist, as you know, what you're creating in general, it's it's all time. It's all what you're passionate about doing. I don't know if I would do do this for 13 years if I wasn't interested in the people that I'm speaking with, like on this show, like on this interview, like the people in the past 13 years that I've I've had over a thousand people here. Everyone's story is, is interesting and relevant. And it comes down to, you know, 
you know, what are they going to create next? And, and will I be around to see that? You know, that's the main thing. You answer the questions. You've gone introspective into your lives and your creativity. And that usually is how this show ends. But before I let you both go, where can we find and support you, not only with this Kickstarter campaign, but also for your own social media and creative endeavors? I think I need a shower, Kurt, after this. <laughs> uh, you can so, find me on Instagram. It's Kdraws Comics. And then uh, you can you can find uh, this book specifically on Instagram. It's uh, it's Gray Sells Comics, Gray Sells Comic, or one word, um, with a with an A, Gray. And we're on Facebook as well, which is facebook.com forward slash Gray Sells Comic. And we've got our own website, um, which is uh, ink dream, inked hyphen dreams.com forward slash Gray hyphen cells. And on there you can get issue one. Um, which is 23 pages. It's a full episode of the six-parter, which, which makes up the, the full book. Got a satisfying sort of uh, narrative in, in itself. Sets things up nicely, gives you a good sense of uh, the world that we're trying to build. And the, the full book uh, will be launching on Kickstarter soon, but you can, you can sign up there. Uh, we'll get you issue one completely free. And also, if you, you sign up early as well, we'll, we'll get you um, extra special rewards that... that um, will just be for you guys. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I do want to thank you both for coming on the show. I, I had a wonderful time. And thank I you, Kurt. To you. Thank you, yeah. You're welcome. The beautiful interview. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I want to thank you both again for coming on the show. I greatly appreciate it. And go ahead and support them on their campaign starting in November. Uh, we'll have a more definitive date when this gets released and where you get to, to see this as well too in the future. But as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell and it's up to me to help bring that out. You can find this interview and thousands of others on our website, 2geekstalking.com or our other website, tgtmedia.com and our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash C forward slash tgtmedia. And thanks again for coming on 2 Geeks Talking and who knows who's going to appear next week on the show. Hey all, Kurt Sasso here from 2 Geeks Talking. If you like this video and these quick clips here, make sure you take a look at our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash TGT Media. Make sure you hit the like button and subscribe as well. Hit the bell to make sure you get notifications, of course, from videos like this here. Thank you everyone for listening and watching over the years and keep listening and watching for new and exciting interviews with talented and creative people in the entertainment industry. I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. Thank you so much.